what's that actor? Michael Caine, a juggernaut trying to figure out what wire to cut. Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. My guests today are Dr. Michael Boren and Dr. Emily Ventura. They wrote an amazing book that I read called Sugar Proof. They're going to be making some recipes from the book, but first, we're going to talk a little bit about them, about the book, why they wrote it, and why they're so interested in having kids not eat sugar, or at least not eat so much sugar. Please welcome them to the show. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having us. Yeah, happy holidays, everyone. Oh, thank you. So how'd you guys come together to write the book? Yeah, uh, Emily was a graduate student in my lab some years ago. So she did did her doctoral work with me, did some of the research that we talked about in the book. Uh, We stayed in touch. And uh, when it was time, when I felt compelled to write this book, I knew that I needed a co-author and Emily was a perfect choice. She's a great writer. She develops recipes. She also has two young kids or had two young kids. They're growing now. I guess they're still young kids. Uh, but yeah, so we stayed in touch and we teamed up for the book. Well, I know most people don't consider sugar a health food, but why is it so important that we not feed our kids at least too much sugar like we're doing? Yeah, well, sugar, too much sugar really can affect kids' bodies all the way from, all the way through the body from head to toe. And kids today are consuming not just more sugar than ever before, but different types of sugar and in different forms. Mostly liquid sugar is one that we're mostly concerned about. It's highly concentrated uh, sugar that can affect the body. Dr. Ventura, are you? Multiple effects. Dr. Ventura, are your kids sugar-free? Well, just like we explained, you know, in our our book, we don't suggest being super restrictive and taking it all out. So my kids do eat treats, but we're really careful about, you know, how we time them. And, you know, another thing is just being careful about what are the daily staples in your house. So we, you know, we talk a lot about the hidden sugars that sort of start to pile up there in breakfast cereals and yogurts and granola bars and juices and things that sort of have these health halos around them that parents think oh it's not so bad you know this chocolate milk at least has got some calcium in it or these granola bars you know they say whole grain and high fiber and you know, all the sneaky marketing makes you think it's it's healthy but really the sugar starts to pile up So sugar proof is about just being smart about those choices and raising kids also who are able to self-regulate and who are able to say, you know, I already had a treat today. I don't really need that second cookie or um, I'll choose water instead of juice because it'll make me feel better and it's better for my body. Do you really think all kids can self-regulate? Because I believe in food addiction, specifically sugar addiction, and I don't think I I was able to, and that's how I became an obese child and I was an obese adult. And when you see a little sugar addict, you see an adult sugar addict. Right, it's true. And it is, you know, the the addictive properties of sugar are real and they do um, have a lot of the same, sugar has a lot of the same properties as other addictive substances. So you can experience the withdrawal and the cravings and all those things. Um, But, you know, if your child is, you know, if what you have in your home is mostly healthy and they have their go-to foods that they, you know, that they can select and and enjoy, then, you know, what I've seen, at least with my kids is when they do overdo it, they recognize it and they say, well, I ate all that, you know, ice cream at the party and mom, I really don't feel well. And I think that's kind of what brings them back to wanting to eat healthier. You know, when they come home, they're they're happy to have some vegetables or you know to have a balanced dinner because they realize, well, I ate that and I don't feel well. So that's kind of part of the process is just you know recognizing that what you eat makes you you know how what you eat makes you feel. Right, Dr. Warren, we have a question in the live chat: Is does sugar promote Alzheimer's? There is some evidence among uh, studies among the elderly population, Uh, not necessarily definitively, but some uh, kind of long-term cohort studies for sugar and also for sugar alternatives. There is evidence that diet sodas, for example, uh, can contribute 
to uh, risk of de developing uh, cognitive decline and Alzheimer's. If you can just speak a little bit more loudly, because you, you are a little bit soft spoken, and I just want to make sure everybody hears you. So yeah, talk about the sugar substitute, because to me, they don't even taste good. And I find that a lot of people are just as addicted to their dropper full bottles of stevia as they are the real thing. Yeah, I mean, I was going to say when you were talking about addiction, the, the addiction is really to sweetness as much as it is to sugar. Uh, so that's the thing we have to target. And so replacing sugar with the alternative sweeteners is really not a great solution uh, because as you said, many of them don't taste great, but also those compounds have other effects on the body that might be different from sugar. And they do not, uh, they do not solve craving for sweetness and craving for food. In fact, studies show that individuals who habitually consume sweeteners end up consuming more calories and more sugar throughout the day. So they can be just as problematical, but for different reasons. Yeah, so it really doesn't even work for weight loss going to zero calorie or low calorie alternative sweeteners is what you're saying, I believe. But the only one study that has shown beneficial effects of sweeteners was done in individuals who were intending to lose weight. So if you are trying to lose weight, there may be some benefit, but that's only one study uh, to this point that has shown that. Where does sugar and weight go hand in hand with, with children? I mean, you know, it's, it's four calories per gram. I mean, it's not as calorically dense as other foods, but like you say, it's added to so many foods. Yeah, the effects really are going well beyond uh, the calories and weight gain. So there's certainly a link between excess sugars and particularly soda consumption and weight gain in children, but we're really talking about effects beyond weight gain and beyond the caloric content. And a lot of this is to do with differences in how different sugars affect the body. And in particular, we're talking about glucose and fructose, which are two identical sugars, both contribute four calories per gram, but metabolically how they affect the body are, are vastly different. And, and it's the fructose that causes problems more so than the glucose. Nice. Uh, Dr. Ventura, did you ever struggle with any kind of sugar addiction growing up? Well, interestingly, I, I was on the sugar roller coaster, um, you know, even into my 20s and you know, before I started studying in graduate school, but not realizing it, you know, by having things like um, high fiber cereal in the morning that was also high in sugar and, um, you know, and just feeling irritable an hour or so later and hungry again. And, um, you know, once I learned more about the glycemic index and about, you know, how to um, avoid that type of roller coaster, I started to feel a lot better. Um, so it's just interesting how, it, you know, that same, those same effects can happen when you're eating foods that, you are, that are marketed as healthy and you think are healthy. Yeah. You know, you said you're not telling parents or people to abstain for sugar, but I mean, why not? Is it just the social reasons? Well, sometimes if you put something on a pedestal, it makes it seem, you know, so appealing and, and um, prohibited and it can, it can lead kids to feel, you know, restricted or even possibly even contribute to an eating disorder. Um, and so we just, you know, want to take some of that, that pedestal effect out of things. So for example, if my kids are at a birthday party, I don't want them to feel like they can't have what the other kids are having, but I also kind of, I raise them to, to say, well, if, you know, there's five different sweet things offered here at this party, I don't need to have all of them. <laughs> I can pick one. Um, so, you know, I think it's just, you know, kind of being more moderate. Um, and, you know, that isn't, that isn't, you know, sometimes maybe they won't have anything and that's great too, but you don't, I think, want to create such a restrictive environment that your kids go crazy as soon as they have a chance on their own. Because I've actually met some kids that were raised without sugar, and I know them now to be adults in their 30s and 40s, and so far they haven't gone crazy. Oh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but their parents actually eat this way too, you know, so it wasn't, yeah, the, you know, I mean, how much of what kids eat is really modeled from what the parents eat? Parental modeling does have a really strong effect. And, um, you know, even there's some positive effect. There's a study done at Stanford that shows that having some positive food rules in the home 
and we're not talking about you know really strict rules but just like we have vegetables at dinner or we drink water or you know we only have desserts on the weekend that those kind of you know simple rules um, that the family follows actually do help kids to make positive choices when they're on their own nice what are the ramifications of eating too much sugar too early in children yeah, those can, those effects can be quite quite broad and in fact one of one thing i'll point out also is that kids because they're developing especially younger kids and including infants and babies even developing babies in utero are actually more susceptible to excess sugar and that's because developing organs like the brain or the liver or the gut uh, things that are evolving uh, during that time can be derailed by too much sugar not derailed by any sugar just we're talking about too much sugar um, being problematic and, and and in particular concentrated sugar and in particular fructose as well and sweeteners I would add as well and that that that, that could include effects on memory and learning and brain development because it's a, 80% of brain development occurs in the first few years of life. Gut health can be affected. The gut microbiome is developing in the first few years of life. So what comes into the gut shapes the gut microbiome and sugar can alter the gut microbiome and then, you, then you're left with that gut microbiome for the rest of your life. So that's yeah. why there's kind of these long-term, potentially long-lasting effects that kids children, infants and children would be more susceptible to because their organs are still developing. Well, when you say too much sugar, what is too much sugar and what is an appropriate amount of sugar? Or will that vary from individual to individual? I think that, that definitely varies de depending on the age. In fact, the new, the new dietary guidelines for America just released in January this year. Uh, call for zero added sugars for the first time in infants between zero and two years of age. This is, this is a new recognition that infants in the first two years of life uh, should not be uh, exposed to added sugar. So here we're talking about sugars added to food. We're not talking about fruit, whole fruit, or we're not talking about fruit in dairy products. Uh, but we are talking about sugars that are extracted from fruit, such as in fruit juice, or added during food processing, zero added sugars between zero and two years of age. And then the recognition is that after two years of age, it's approximately, or the, rec the, rec the recommendation is less than 10% of calories, which is very different than it from a two-year-old to a 16-year-old because they're bigger. But that varies from about, what does it work out to, Emily, for two-year-old about? Three to seven teaspoons a day. Three to seven teaspoons of added sugar per day in a, a two or a three-year-old up to an 18-year-old that's more like a uh, max of, what, 12 teaspoons per day or something like that. We have you a know, nice tab table in the book that, that uh, is a guideline. But th these, are, these are recommendations. I don't think it's of use to count every single gram of sugar, but I think it's a good guideline or recommendation to aim for. Well, if somebody's drinking a soda, they're already over the limit. Yeah, yeah, and that's you got it. a lot of everyday items like a soda or a glass of juice or a sugary breakfast cereal, you can easily uh, exceed the daily recommendations. So I think that's a good kind of thing to have in mind for, for parents is to know what the uh, daily guidelines are, and then can eyeball that up against the added sugars in a serving of something that they're purchasing. Why are liquid sugar calories especially problematic, not just for children, but for everyone? Yeah, yeah, it's, be it's because they come in to the body at very high concentrations. And it turns out that the, the liver processes sugars. Uh, and if, everything that you consume that goes through the gut comes through the liver. But uh, fructose, one of the sugars in sucrose, which is ordinary table sugar, is processed entirely by the liver. So just like the liver extracts alcohol or drugs or toxins out of the blood, it also extracts fructose. And it's very sensitive to how rapidly what the concentration is of fructose that's coming in. 
So if you can imagine drinking a glass of juice or drinking a glass of soda versus eating an apple, just imagine that with the glass of soda or juice that is highly concentrated, the liver is exposed to this high concentration of fructose and it overwhelms the metabolic capacity and it ends up being uh, converted into fat under those conditions. And please remember to speak a little bit louder, Dr. Gorn, because people are saying they're having a little bit trouble hearing you because you are a soft-spoken individual. Do you think part of the problem isn't just that kids are eating sugar in places that we expect it, like treats and dessert, but that it's everywhere where it doesn't even need to be, like tomato sauce and, you know, I mean, I make ketchup all the time. I don't, I don't put sugar in it. Right. Yeah, well, that's 70%. 70% of foods in the grocery store do have added sugars. And so it's those hidden sugars that can, can easily be uh, identified and, and substituted out for other, other products. Yeah. So uh, Dr. Ventura, do you uh, like to make treats for your kids that are healthy but don't have sugar? I do. And that's one of the things we're going to be making today. It's a recipe from our book and we also have it on the blog and it's one of my kids' favorite treats. And they like to have this in their lunch is a little, a little treat. And so um, there are no big chocolate sesame squares. Yum. I love Did them you- too. They're so good. <laughs> what, what, yeah, most people, most, what kids don't, don't love uh, chocolate. Yeah. Exactly. And they're so easy to make. They're no bake and you can keep them in your freezer. And so they're the perfect thing to just put in the lunchbox. And then by lunchtime, they've defrosted and they're also nut free, which is great because my kids are at a school where they can't have nuts. Oh yeah, that's good. That's true. Cause uh, that they have rules now at school where you can't have food with nuts, even if you can have nuts. Exactly. Yeah. Do you want to show us how to make it? I would love to. Yeah. So let's see, I hope you guys can see what I'm doing here. Um, you make this recipe in the food processor. So I have my food processor here, got all the ingredients. So basically you just put everything in the food processor and blend it up and press it into a, into a pan. So we've got um, half a cup of rolled oats here. And we've got um, sesame seeds. So you can use black sesame seeds or white sesame seeds. I am using a mix because I think it looks really pretty, but you can use whatever you, you know, whatever you have. This is three fourths of a cup of sesame seeds, which are great. These, all these ingredients are contributing fiber and beneficial nutrients. Whereas, you know, a standard like cookie that you might put in just has a lot of white flour and white sugar and not much nutritional benefit. Um, and then there's a third of a cup of raw cacao powder that I'm adding for the chocolate. And then we've got a cup and a half of dates, and this is what adds the sweetness to the recipe and also adds fiber and some other nutrients. You have some really wonderful looking recipes on your blog, like banana sushi, that looks yeah. terrific. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we like to have fun with this. And then there's some tahini in the recipe as well, which is, gives sort of a depth of flavor with the sesame. So this is just blended sesame seeds. There's a third of a cup of that in there. And it gives the flavor as if they've, they've been baked, even though they haven't. And a pinch of sea salt. Or a contrast here. And then you just put um, about two tablespoons of water. You might have to add a little bit more depending on um, how um, dry or, or moist your dates are. So I'm gonna start with two tablespoons. And then you blend it. It's gonna be noisy just for a minute. Yeah, what, we're, what we like to do with these recipes is take family favorites recipes and just find creative ways to make them sweet and flavorful as well as nutrient packed. So this is a good example of, of that uh, process. And I mean, some of the other recipes, like for example, you mentioned the banana sushi, there's also uh, 
a recipe for a, a sugarproof Nutella, because who doesn't love Nutella? But Emily created a version of Nutella with no added sugar. Well, dates, I added another tablespoon of water. I mean, dates are so amazing. This is what I don't understand because I'm not of all from depriving children, but anything anyone can do with sugar, I can do with dates. And that's why I say, why give them sugar when the alternative is just as delicious? Maybe even right. more so. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so basically this all comes together into a dough that, um, you know, you can tell it's, it's ready when it kind of holds together. And then you just put it into um, a baking can lined with some parchment paper. And put another um, sheet of parchment paper on top. I'm gonna move over a little bit so you can see me. I made these earlier today, so I'll show you. So you just put another sheet of, of parchment paper down on top of it, and then I use the um, measure a measuring cup. You can use whatever you want to press it down, but I find that um, a flat surface like the bottom of the measuring cup works really well to press it into shape. And you just flatten it out, and then sprinkle a few more sesame seeds on the top, and then um, put it in the refrigerator. You can cut them straight away, but they cut a little bit neater if you chill them for about a half hour. And then it comes out like this. You just lift the whole parchment out, put it onto a cutting board, and then cut them into squares. And they look like this. They're so tasty. I love them so much. They look rich and delicious. Yeah, they're really satisfying. And they don't, you know, they don't leave you feeling bad after which is amazing. Sometimes you eat a treat and it's, it tastes good. And then uh, shortly after you really don't feel well. Um, and this isn't like that. These are really good. Um, they look, they look like a rich dessert. Yeah. You, you could probably cut those out with uh, cookie cutter molds in different shapes as well, probably, right? For Definitely. Would that work? Mm -hmm. For sure. And you can roll them into balls too. Sometimes we make them more like energy bites. We have a recipe for energy bites. Um, that's a flexible recipe in our book too, where basically you choose your favorite um, dried fruit and your favorite nut or seed, and there's some oats in it, and then different flavorings. And we give a chart for our, some of the flavor combinations we like, but it's a flexible recipe, so you can put what you like in it, and it still works. Yeah. I mean, that they, I, I, you could fool any kid with that, I bet. I mean, you know, what do you, yeah, get, really do you give that out for Halloween? Like, what do you give out for Halloween? Both of you? Cause uh, do you, do you give out candy or do you give out toothbrushes? <laughs> you know, I didn't, uh, Halloween isn't a huge thing. I'm in the UK. It's not a huge thing in our neighborhood. So we were invited to a party and we weren't home. So I didn't really have to broach the, the topic this year, um, but it is a tricky one. I don't feel great about giving stuff out, but you know, I guess I, I might if, uh, if I was in a neighborhood where it was, where a lot of people came to the house. Yeah, so Halloween's a, a tricky one. Uh, I, we live in a neighborhood that has, has a lot of Halloween visitors and I actually enjoyed giving out Halloween candy. Uh, Kids try to grab a whole handful, but I try to try to um, fashion it a little bit. Um, but it's just kind of a fun event, isn't it, for for young kids? It's such a such a fun, exciting thing to knock on a stranger's door and get a little treat. Uh, so I think it's a fun a fun celebration. I think what we try to do we do we do have a version of these actually that we mold into Halloween scary shapes that uh, can, 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 can be used. And we try to talk about how to uh, regulate the amount of candy that it's consumed. We talk about the, the switch witch that comes and takes away the vast the majority of the candy in exchange for a gift. So we, we're trying to be creative about fun ways to make this a healthier celebration. Than it typically can be. You know, you once, once a kid develops that, that sweet tooth, you know, you mentioned that, that the guidelines are now, they have no, no sugar zero to two, but if people are doing smash cakes, kids are getting exposed to refined sugar before the age of two. 
yeah, for sure. For sure, there's a mismatch. And hopefully, I don't know how the food industry is going to respond to that uh, in terms of altering their products. But and if, if a woman can't breastfeed, a kid is being exposed to sugar right out the gate because formula is sugar, at least the ones I've seen. Well, yeah, formula is a tricky one uh, because la lactose is a natural. So, so if it's a lactose-based formula or a cow's milk-based formula, it's, it's not added sugars because it's, it's the natural form. But there are some formulas that are made, for example, with corn syrup solids, which I would consider added sugar, but there's a loophole uh, in that the USDA, for some reason, uh, has, says that formula is uh, exempt from being categorized as something containing added sugars. I don't know why it seems kind of crazy, but we're actually doing some research to show how that can be problematic. And we have a couple of studies underway looking at that. Yeah. So at what age should a parent introduce sugar to a kid just whenever they ask? Because what if they don't ask? <laughs> well, yeah, if they don't ask, then you're, you're in shape. But um, that, that would be unusual. I mean, and just, just to address your issue of uh, sugar craving. So one thing we do in Sugar Proof is we do believe that that craving for sugar can be downgraded. And we have, we, we've, we've worked with you know, probably hundreds of families by now who have done our seven day no added sugar challenge with their families and with their kids. And uh, I'm boiling my milk over there for the hot chocolate. Uh, and what we've shown is that um, even after seven days, if, if you can keep your kids off of padded sugars for seven days, you can definitely dampen down that craving for, for sweetness. Nice. What, what, what about once you're an adult, how do you, how do you fix that? Because it, as so many people watching are saying they feel like they've struggled with sugar their entire life. Well, there's a, it's a, it's a family uh, activity and a family challenge for, for parents and grandparents doing, you know, enjoy the holidays, but after the holidays, take a week uh, where you decide not to have added sugars. It's just kind of a reset, kind of a reboot control all delete for your body to reset its, its preferences its taste preferences and it can be difficult for the for the first few days because it can be it is very addictive so the first day or two can be troublesome but what we found is that after those first few days children or adults uh, find many benefits from that reset and also, if, you, if you're not ready to commit to going cold turkey for a week, we have another challenge in the book that's a gradual 28-day process where you don't have to take everything out. You just slowly start changing your habits. And, and that sometimes works really well for you know, kids and adults alike. How do we get kids to eat more healthy food, whether they eat sugar or not? Things like fruits and vegetables, especially vegetables. I remember talking to Dr. Nicole Avina and she said, most kids will eat fruit, but the minute they turn their face away from a vegetable, the parent's like, oh, he doesn't like vegetables. Mm -hmm. Well, I, for me, my favorite way to do it is to familiarize them with the vegetables by, help, by inviting them to help pick them out um, and even help grow them if that's possible. That's like the, you know, the top, idea would be if you could grow them or if you can go to the farm shop or the farmer's market or even the grocery store and pick something out. And that doesn't mean that they're going to necessarily try it. It might take dozen, you know, a dozen exposures to a particular vegetable and maybe even more for them to just decide, oh, maybe I feel like trying that. Um, so you really have to be patient, but just even getting their hands on it or, you know, their input and into that decision of, oh, we're going to bring home you know, these yellow squashes that I've never seen before, or we're going to, you know, I'm going to snap off the ends of the green beans and maybe I don't feel like eating them today, but maybe, you know, maybe one day they will. Um, and that's been, that's been the most successful for um, the, you know, the kids that I've worked with and my own kids as well. Uh, how do you work with children in what capacity? Well, right now I'm just, you know, I'm working, um, on sugar proof. So, I mean, I'm working virtually. I used to work in the community in different settings and I also worked in research settings and in research studies, teaching families. 
um, the studies that Michael um, designed. And that was really, really a great experience to see, you know, we, in one of the studies, we were going into homes and working with people and, and you know, helping them go through their cupboards and um, helping them make some changes. And then the very precise measures that he's, he's able to do in his studies, um, you know, show what those results are of making small changes that end up having a big impact even after a you know, relatively short amount of time. How does a parent know if their kid has a problem with sugar? Because I don't think any kid would say, hey, mom, I think I'm eating too much sugar. I mean, yeah, that can be manifested uh, in a number of different ways. Excess weight gain would be the most kind of obvious. And, and it is problematic because some of the issues that we're concerned about are, are kind of long-term, slowly developing chronic conditions like type 2 diabetes, fatty liver disease, cardiovascular disease, which are all uh, can all be related to too much sugar consumption. The signs of those are not obvious until sometimes it's even too late by adulthood. So in childhood, it's not always clear. Some of the other signs that, that kids might be more motivated by might be um, things like poor skin, uh, concentration, ability to concentrate in school, uh, poor sleep, uh, things like th things like that, or more, or, or even asthma, or some of the other might might be manifested earlier in life. What about this increase in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, even in children? I know I've heard Dr. Lustig talk a lot about that. Right. Well, th this wasn't even a, a disease uh, ten or fifteen years ago. Most fatty liver disease was due to alcohol. But now the most common form of liver disease is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, caused not by alcohol, but by sugar and in particular fructose because of the pathway that I described earlier of fructose being taken up by the liver and metabolized almost exactly in the same way as alcohol is metabolized, uh, being converted into fat in the liver, causing an inflammatory cascade those pathways are almost identical for fructose and alcohol. So that, that's now a serious problem that's emerging earlier in life and could eventually causing liver failure. Do you think that the fact that they changed the way sugar is delivered is part of the problem? I mean, when I was little, Coke was sweetened with sugar. Now it's corn syrup, right? Yes. But it's, it's partly due to uh, more use of fructose as a sweetener, including high fructose corn syrup, but not just high fructose corn syrup, which a lot of parents know to look out for, but fructose-based sugars such, such as fruit purees, fruit sugar. These are high, higher in the fructose, in fact, more fructose than high fructose corn syrup. Uh, so more fructose-based sugars and more liquid sugars because of this issue of the concentration of sugar hitting the liver, both of those factors are, are involved. How do we get the parents in schools to realize that juice is not a health food? I mean, you would never eat the amount of apples or oranges that go into that little juice box. And before the pandemic, I used to volunteer at schools, age K through 12, uh, doing pet therapy. And if I was there during this one period between breakfast and lunch, they would have like a nutrition break and they would literally give the kids, you know, juice boxes. Yeah, which would be the equivalent of eating two to three apples uh, over you know, five minutes. So I think this is a problem. Unfortunately, again, the USDA does not currently recognize the sugars in juice as added sugar. So technically, we're not supposed to count those as added sugars. We do at Sugar Proof, and I think parents should as well. The American Academy of Pediatrics, for example, has some uh, pretty, uh, pretty rigid recommendations on how much juice should be considered uh, for young children. So I think it's very problematic. Of course, even for young children, they have a lot of problems at digesting fructose because we weren't set up to be consuming this much fructose. So in the early stages, it's gonna cause a lot of uh, gut problems. And in fact, uh, one study 
done in young children showed that unexplained tummy aches was due to high consumption of liquid fructose. Mm. Uh, there's a question in the live chat from Victoria. Is there a best time of day for eating fruits? Not real, not that we know of. There could well be, it could be different for different people. I don't think there's any real evidence on pros or cons of different times of day. The only thing that I would recommend, which we talked about in the book, is not to eat a lot all at once. So those two or three apples I mentioned earlier, if you eat them all at once quickly, uh, it will cause problems. But if you eat three apples a day spread out, it's not so problematic. It's to do, again, with how much and how quickly that fructose is absorbed in, into the and hitting the whole but I, I don't see a lot of people like walking around gorging on apples because in a whole food, like a fruit, there's fiber and water and vitamins and minerals and phytochemicals and antioxidants. It doesn't, you know, really make people, I mean, I'm sure there's exceptions, but you know, when I eat an apple, I eat an apple. I don't think like, oh, I got to have two more apples, but when I eat a cookie, I got to eat two more cookies. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah, that's yeah. a great point. But, uh, but for, for apple juice, you're, you know, you're tossing out the fiber and all those fiber nutrients, but not all of them, but most of them get, uh, get, get thrown out. So that's, that's the problem. Uh, here's a fun question for both of you. What, what's the, uh, like the most uh, rewarding thing you've seen in your work? And like, like, do you have a worst case child? Like one that was like, I mean, I, I would have been it if you had known me. I mean, come on, Coke Slurpees for breakfast. You can't get much worse than that, right? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's just, I think most rewarding for me is when we get the messages that come in that said, wow, I didn't realize, you know, that my child's moodiness and all these, you know, issues that we were having were sugar related. And now that we've made these changes, we have a different child on our hands, you know, it's so much more enjoyable to interact with my child. My family life is more harmonious, you know, and, you know, I think it's just, it's really exciting when people have that transformation. Yeah. Are either of you familiar with Dr. Joel Furman's book, Fast Food Genocide, where he, or Disease Proof Your Child, where he talks about, you know, eating, how a child eats the first 10 years really can set the stage for all kinds of adult diseases later, even behavioral things. Yeah, I should not familiar with that book. I'll look out for it, but it's, we're talking about the same principle. I would even you know, wind that back to talk about the first two, three years uh, be, being critical. Yeah, absolutely. And what about the mother's nutrition? I mean, isn't it doesn't that affect whether or not I mean, I'm pretty sure my mom, all she ate during her pregnancy was M&Ms with peanuts, because I don't I mean, doesn't what a mother eats affect the child's future as far as their cravings and what their preferences are? Yeah, for sure. There's certainly studies that show that uh, maternal consumption of sugars or even maternal consumption of low calorie sweeteners uh, can affect the developing offspring and contribute to risk of developing things like uh, excess weight gain and cardiometabolic problems in the child. Uh, difficult studies to do. They're not, they're not easy studies and they're long-term studies, but there is evidence to that effect. And also what mom eats whilst breastfeeding uh, can, can have an impact also on the quality of the milk. So how can we enjoy the holidays or, or life in general without this sugar overload that most people succumb to? First of all, get a copy of this, sugar proof. <laughs> That's really what it's all about, is, is uh, still enjoying uh, those, those celebrations, those family events, uh, but without as much reliance on sugar uh, as a sweetener or using natural sweeteners like like dates or the bananas. Uh, yeah, there's a question. What do you guys think of date syrup? Date, but my understanding is date syrup is still a whole food. It, it is processed, but it's, it's... I think it depends on how it's made because it could be strained. And if it's, if it's boiled, if it's dates that are boiled, blended, and then strained, then you're losing some of the fiber that... Um, is beneficial. So I think, you know, if you're making it yourself or if you know how it's made and it's blended and not strained, then I think that's fine. Um, but we even still do use date, dates in moderation because they are even, quite sweet. Yeah. And even actually date sugar, uh, 
which is hard to work with, but it's still probably okay because it's just uh, ground dates. Uh, but you know, we, we can talk about some other, other strategies, but one of our biggest, simplest strategy, if you are baking this holiday, is just to use less sugar. So if a recipe calls for a cup of sugar, just go for three quarters of a cup of sugar, or maybe even half a cup, or maybe gradually go down, uh, because most recipes just call for too much sugar. Uh, but reducing it by 30 to 50% is not going to affect the quality of the product. Do you think that the reason the food manufacturers put sugar in there is so that we'll like their product more and get hooked and buy more of it? Yes. Definitely. I thought so. <laughs> Not just that it's cheap, but, but you know, the way, the way food is subsidized too, it makes it so unfair, you know, because junk food is cheap fruits. And I mean, comparatively fruits and vegetables are more expensive. Yeah, that's right. There's a mismatch, unfortunately, economically. So that's partly why there's a huge economic disparity in some of these issues too. Yeah. Yeah. Talk a bit about the economic disparity, because that, 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 I, I hear about that a lot. And is there anything we can do to improve that? Well, I think it's, it's difficult because it's going to take you know, huge adjustments in the way food is subsidized um, and distributed. So things like why is water uh, more expensive than soda? Fresh fruits and vegetables more subsidized. Uh, these things are, are, are very difficult deep political issues that are going to be very difficult to change, unfortunately. And there's the whole just issue of food deserts and you know, access to healthy foods. Uh, but I think, we're, 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 you know, slowly trying to address that issue, there's this perception that healthy food is more expensive. Uh, but I know we're doing studies on this to try and demonstrate how you can still eat healthy even on a uh, food stamp type budget, which is $600 for a family of four for a month. Uh, so the question is, can you still eat healthy on that? Wow. Well, you know, you mentioned like in, in uh, Dr. Ventura's school that you can't bring nuts because their kids might be allergic. Why, why, don't, why do they allow sugar at school? I'm not saying, I'm not a parent. So I'm on the abstinence train because I have seen lives destroyed by sugar addiction and food addiction. So I'm like, if you can do it, I'm for abstinence. I'm not for forcing abstinence on anybody that doesn't want it, but I find that it really does work and you can still enjoy life without it. But why do they have to have sugar in school? Like it's different if it's the treats are at home and the, but you, you know what I'm saying? Like, why, why do they have to have such crappy food at school? It's a really complex issue. And, you know, I know I've spoken and worked with a number of food service directors and they're up against so much pressure because they're receiving funding from the government based on participation. And so they need to be serving things that are popular with the kids and sugar is popular with the kids. So when you start taking away some of those options, less kids participate and their school receives less funding. Um, yeah, and beyond that, you know, some of it, it can just be habits and tradition, you know, so maybe the school's always used to, uh, you know, having, letting kids bring things in um, on birthdays or teachers that give out candy. And, you know, I think as a parent, if you express to the school, you know, and, and if a number of parents express to the school, hey, actually, I don't want this, my kids don't need this, um, then slowly things can change within the system, but fundamentally we have some major problems with the system. Yeah, schools are happy to distribute uh, chocolate milk or flavored milk because it's more likely to be consumed versus regular milk. So school boards are willing to do that to accept the benefit of, uh, of consuming milk against the adverse effects of the sugar that's in there. There's not enough understanding yet, unfortunately, on a big scale of how damaging sugar can be in the long term. Yeah. There's a question in the chat. Do you worry in kids just about sugar or also about fat and salt? Because processed food tends not to just be high in sugar, but also very high in fat and very high in salt. Yeah, for sure. Uh, those can be problematic. 
70% of processed foods, 80% of processed foods targeted towards children and, and sugars. Uh, it's not the only issue, but it's one that we can readily modify. Um, but for sure, those other factors are, are evident, but this is based on research. I mean, I've been doing this research for over 30 years. And while sugar is not the only thing that we found to be problematic, it is one that is recurring in many, many studies that we have done to be uh, more damaging uh, for chronic diseases for children. Yeah. Wow. So other than buying your book, what, what can we do? <laughs> well, Work with your really. kids. Get your kids yeah. involved in, you know, in making and tasting. And, and it's not just about, you know, taking out the sugar. It's about, like you said, adding in um, other flavors and foods and, yeah. you know, just increasing their exposure to different things and involving wow. them in the process so that they become, you know, adults and teenagers and adults who really enjoy eating well. Because we're all about the enjoyment here. You know, we're not expecting that you're going to be eating these dull, you know, foods that don't taste good. It's about really like, you know, vibrant flavors and, and fresh ingredients and they don't have to be fancy. You know, we say just, you know, one simple meal at a time. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Gorn, I think you are going to show us a recipe too, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. I need to get someone to help me with the filming. If some. Coco, can you come help me with this? Or are you but I, I need I need a filmer. <laughs> Coco? My daughter said she was gonna help me. But, so your uh, daughter is actually named after a dessert. <laughs> yes. So she she is named after the uh, main ingredient of uh, of, of what I'm gonna use, uh, cacao powder. Not cocoa powder, but cacao powder. So this is less less processed than cocoa powder. So it has a higher concentration of flavonoids and other uh, beneficial uh, compounds. So I'm actually gonna make like a hot chocolate because it's winter time. Who doesn't like hot chocolate on a, on a cold night? But how do, you, how do you make a hot chocolate drink uh, without added sugar? So uh, what I've done here, we have this recipe in the book too. I've got two cups of, of milk that I've preheated. And when, and when you say milk, can it be plant milk? Because my audience is pretty much all vegan. Yes, me, not, me too. Not entirely, but this is actually oat milk. Oh, it oat can milk's be, good. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we like oat milk in our house, but it could be any kind of milk, regular milk or a plant-based milk. And um, so we again, we sweeten with... with uh, with dates, I'm gonna make two cups. So I use about two, two dates per cup. If you want it a bit sweeter, you could use three dates, but I've, I've chopped them in half and I'm just gonna put them in there uh, with, the, with, with the cocoa powder. I think it's a teaspoon of this cocoa powder per cup of milk. So I'm gonna put two teaspoons of that in. And I'm just going to heat that up. I actually had it preheated, preheating. But if you if you heat it up with the with the dates, you get more of the flavor infusing in there. But you can also add other things to this too. If there's other uh, things you want to add in there, like I was thinking, I have these uh, roasted hazelnuts that I made the other day for topping oatmeal, I thought I might throw some of those in there. And actually when I bought the cocoa powder, I noticed we had a cocoa powder that also had acai and goji powder in there too. So you get extra boosting of anti-inflammatory uh, plant-based products in there too. I just got the regular one today. But I think I will throw in a few roasted hazelnuts just for fun. I'm just going to heat that up. I saw up a hazelnut um, hot chocolate on the menu at the coffee shop today. And really? those drinks are just, yeah, but you know how much sugar is in those. You know, it's probably yeah. equivalent to five, six teaspoons of added sugar. They are so, so sweet. And the sizes are huge too. So it just really is like a big bomb. 
Yeah, well, that, I'm going to put in a few extra hazelnuts there because that's a good, I just, uh, sounds good. It's like, it's almost like a hot Nutella drink, right? It's like, it's like yeah. the uh, Nutella warmed up. Uh -huh. But basically, I'm just going to heat that up for a bit. Um, and then I'm just going to blend it and drink it. Now, my daughter Coco said she would film it if I gave her a cup, but she's not <laughs> filming it. So I think she's blown it. For her cup of hot chocolate. <laughs> uh, so that's basically it. Um, I'm just going to blend that now once it comes to the back up to the boil again. And um, that's a hot chocolate, but there's no added sugar. How old is Coco? Uh, she is 19. She's just back from college. She just got oh. back two days ago. She's been in Ireland for the last three months in her first semester at school. Oh, I was going to ask her if uh, it's hard, but she she's she's she can eat what she wants now. So, yeah, well, pretty much. Actually, actually, that's completely true because in college she has to like buy her own food and cook everything. She doesn't have a whoa oh shoot boiled over. Uh -oh. it's definitely, it's definitely boiled now. Um, but yeah. She's uh, buying buying her own food and cooking all of her own food pretty much now. So it's game over for us. Do you think parents should use uh, treats as a reward? Like, I mean, I grew up like you had to clear your plate to get dessert and I was full, but I would do anything to get dessert, even eat things that I didn't want when I was not hungry. Emily, you want to take that whilst I blend this for a minute? Yeah, sure. You know, it's a, it's a tricky one. You know, sometimes my kids will not have finished their, their vegetables and their food and they'll say, can we still have dessert? And, you know, usually I'll say, well, if you didn't have room for the vegetables, then do you have room for the dessert? <laughs> and, and they'll sometimes say no. And I say, well, we'll just have it a different time. You know, maybe if it's at lunch and, they, you know, maybe at dinner or maybe we'll have that tomorrow. Um, but, you know, I think as a parent, you kind of have to work with your children. Um, and, you know, I think being reasonable um, with them, at least for me and my kids, goes a long way. But also, you don't want to be a pushover. So it's, it's kind of a fine line. And I definitely don't want to say, oh, eat all your food so you can have your dessert. You know, I don't want to be sending that kind of message. Right. Well, my husband does the same thing. He never finishes his dinner because he says he's full, but then he always eats dessert. Yeah, it's like that separate dessert stomach concept. Exactly. <laughs> I thought I was the only one that had that. But that looks delicious, yeah. Dr. Gorin. Yeah, maybe I'll put a shot of whiskey in here or something, too. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds very Scottish. Well, we don't, yeah, we don't want to actually do that for the children. No, no, no. <laughs> That's for the, for the parents and grandparents. I know, I know that, I know you're kidding. So uh, Victoria <laughs> watching live said in the chat, autistic children seem to crave sugar so much. Is there anything you can do about that? That's really good, by the way. Um, that's a great question. You know, there's not, there's, there's not really any studies to show that sugar causes those issues. But certainly studies show that reducing sugar can relieve or help with some of the symptoms. Yeah. We just wow. don't have enough, we just don't have enough studies on that. Wow. Well, very cool. Let's okay, see. family, who wants hot chocolate around here? <laughs> nope, well, nobody's showing up. We well, can always pass, pass them through the phone. I'm I'm game. <laughs> you can always save it for Santa. You see, you got to realize Santa, the reason Santa is so heavy is because every single person is leaving cookies out for him. That's right. That's right. Yeah. I think we'll be leaving out these sesame squares for Santa right here. I was going to say, maybe we could have a work to have, leave a more healthy food out for Santa. Yeah. Well, we, we usually, we usually leave a carrot for the reindeer. Maybe Santa, maybe it's Santa that eats the carrots, not the reindeer. Oh, that's funny. Let me take you off. 
All right, I'll bring myself back on the screen now so I can show the people your book again. I actually, even though I have the book, guys, I listened to it on Audible. And Dr. Gorin is actually one of the speakers on the upcoming Truth About Weight Loss Summit, where he's going to talk a lot about the science and childhood obesity. So get the book first so that you'll understand everything he has to say in the February summit. Well, guys, thank you for your work. I wish there were people like you when I was growing up that were telling parents, like, maybe not so much sugar, maybe wait till they're two, you know? Thank yeah. you so much um, for having us. Yeah, Shabhi, thank you Jay. so much. Yeah. Yeah, you're, you're a wonderful host and so inspirational thank with you. your story. If you have any parents, you know, that, I mean, I, I can tell them what it's like. It's, I mean, it, you know, it's not fun to have a, a obesity as a kid or to grow up with a sugar addiction. So I would say any parents watching, read, read this book and do something now because like it doesn't get easier as you get older. You don't like start liking sugar less. If anything, you like it more and you need more and more and more just to get the same effect. Yeah, Hopefully, and the yeah. book actually also makes a great gift for teachers and for grandparents as well. Um, so, you know, if you're struggling, if you're a parent um, and you're struggling with your, your own parents, like your grandparents spoiling your children, giving them the book is a great option. Or if your kids are at school and you're not happy about the choices that are offered, you can give the book to your school the teachers or the school food service directors as well. Well, I, lo I love the title because sugar proof, like sugar proof, but sugar, like there's proof, like you're, you know, I get it, like good title. <laughs> like, That's mul it. multiple, multiple meanings. Uh, there's, there's definitely proof of sugar and you want to be sugar proof. And you want to be protected, uh, just like you baby proof your house when you brought your baby, baby home, you got to sugar proof your house too. Absolutely. And life can be pretty sweet without it, especially when you make desserts like you guys made. Cheers. All right. Look, I am. Thank you guys so much. Happy holidays to you. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow. We have another fabulous cooking demo. No sugar, of course. Acorn squash and creme brulee made by Mio Kiyomi of Semi. I can't remember who my guest is. Thanks guys so much and good luck. I hope people will get the book because it's really good. Thank, thank you. you, Chef AJ. Happy holidays. Thanks, Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.